Three days before our Miss Sunday, and poppies had already been placed on individual war graves. Before you left, I pinned one onto your lapel. Crimped petals, spasms of paper red, disrupting a blockard of yellow bias binding around your blazer. Sellotape bandaged around my hands, I rounded up as many white cat hairs as I could, smoothed down your shirt's upturned collar, steeled the softening of my face. I wanted to graze my nose across the tip of your nose, play at being Eskimos, like we did when you were little. I resisted the impulse to run my fingers through the gel blackthorns of your hair. All my words flattened, rolled, turned into felt, slowly melting. I was brave as I walked with you to the front door, threw it open, the world overflowing like a treasure chest. A split second and you were away, intoxicated. After you'd gone, I went into your bedroom, released a songbird from its cage. Later, a single dove flew from the pear tree, and this is where it has led me. Skirting the churchyard walls, my stomach busy making tucks, darts, pleats, hatless without a winter coat or reinforcements of scarf, gloves. On reaching the top of the hill, I traced the inscriptions on the war memorial, leaned against it like a wishbone. The dove pulled freely against the sky, an ornamental stitch. I listened, hoping to hear your playground voice catching on the wind. The author, Jane Weir, is a poet who was born in 1963. The majority of her writing and poetry focuses upon women and their experiences. She lived in England, Italy and Northern Ireland. Her time in Northern Ireland was during the 1980s, which would mean that she had witnessed conflict firsthand during the Troubles. She's also a clothes designer, hence the many textile references throughout her poetry. She was asked by Carol Ann Duffy, an established and respected poet, to join a group of ten writers to create poems about war experiences following the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. It was in a collection called Exit Wounds and largely looked at the impacts of war after the matter. The author said she wrote this poem from the perspective of a mother. She tried to imagine how she would feel if either of her two sons went to war, but it became a poem about the extreme anxiety many parents face when letting their children go. Armistice Sunday, or Remembrance Day as you may know it, is the day that signified the end of World War One, and has since been allocated to remembering all the soldiers that have participated in or died in any war. Following the end of World War One, poppies grew in the field it was fought in, and they have come to symbolise remembering all those that fought for our freedoms and died in the war. This symbolic flower is the title of the poem we will now look at. Following your first read, you can go back through in an analytical manner, which means to break things up. Then, with our investigation hat on, we need to process the idea that is coming across, how it makes us feel, and then figure out how words have managed to make us feel something. It's a good idea to write notes around the poem to help you track what is going on. And ultimately, this is important because it will help you to connect with our language so that in future we know how to express ourselves and communicate clearly with others. I'll read line by line and then say my internal monologue out loud so you can hear my thought processes, which will be helpful when you need to tackle unseen poetry without me. The opening reads, three days before Armist Sunday and poppies had already been placed on individual war graves. My instant reaction is, wow, what a depressing setting. It's so gloomy. But that's my reaction. You might feel pride or appreciation. But my personal feelings about war mean that I just feel a great weight of sadness. Then all my training to break up language and see its layers kicks in and I think, oh, modern poetry. We often see this first person perspective that is rather narrative. Here, although vague, we get that classic opening of setting and characters that you would expect to see in a short story. 
then I think the person speaking is going to tell me a story about something to do with war. And again, the sadness kicks in. Then it reads, before you left, I pinned onto your lapel, crimped petals, spasms of paper red, disrupting a blockade of yellow bias binding around your blazer. As a reader, this now triggers how I personally feel about being left. And I don't know about you, but it's not good. But I wonder who the you is in this poem, who it is directed at or about. Is it a brother, sister, dad, mum, husband, wife, cousin, friend? And I want to figure it out because ultimately knowing other people don't like being left, but have been left, helps me to make sense of the world and realise I'm not the only person to ever experience that and feel pain because of that. Then that training kicks back in and I think this is a lot of negative, destructive words to use when you're actually just describing a blazer. They must be angry about something. The kind of anger where it gets into everything because it's such a big deal to you. I wonder what could have caused such anger. Maybe it's to do with the war. We move stanza and it moves time. It's a flashback. I think we'll get to see what made them so angry. It reads, sellotape bandaged around my hand. I rounded up as many cat hairs as I could, smoothed down your shirt's upturned collar, steeled the softening of my face. Can't say I see anything that would make them angry here. Maybe this is before the negative thing happened. It sounds like someone's getting dressed up for something important. Maybe like prom. But again, bandaged and rounded. Seems like there's a bit of an indirect meaning. I wonder what it could be. Then it goes on to say, I want to graze my nose across the tip of your nose, play at being Eskimos like we did when you were little. I resisted the impulse to run my fingers through the gelled black thorns of your hair. It sounds here like it's a child and a parent and that parent's being a bit motherly. But there's loads of past tense words here. Wanted, did, were. Maybe the child grew up or maybe it's a transitional phase from becoming a teenager to an adult. Or maybe they're not here anymore. Or maybe the parent just still wants to treat them like they're a child and isn't ready to let go of that childhood bond yet. Then it says, all my world's flattened, rolled, turned into felt, slowly melting. It sounds like the parent doesn't know what to say. Maybe they're getting upset and they're trying to, to hide it. Or if they try to speak, it's making them stutter. But the melting part, that's like a slow destruction. Maybe it was hard watching the child grow up. But the super negative language is here again. And it makes it sound more like something was destroyed or taken rather than just lost or left. We still don't know what's made the speaker this frustrated. Maybe we will in the next section. We are still looking for that climatic moment, the event or decision that impacted the speaker where everything changed. It reads, I was brave as I walked with you to the front door. So although the speaker sounds upset, they're still being supportive and trying to be there for the person who is leaving. Then, through it open, the world overflowing like a treasure chest, a split second and you were away, intoxicated. The person leaving sounds super excited or under the influence of something. Perhaps under the influence that what he's going on to is going to be great and fun and honourable. But in all that, that person hasn't noticed that the speaker is sad. Then we seem to find out what made the speaker so angry. After you'd gone, I went into your bedroom, released a songbird from its cage. Later, a single dove flew from the pear tree. And this is where it has led me, skirting the churchyard walls. It sounds like whoever left died. And now... The person left behind can only hang around in graveyards to be close to them. Then, 
my stomach busy making tucks, darts, pleats, hatless, without a winter coat or reinforcements of scarf, gloves. The speaker is so struck with grief and saddened that she's forgotten her own coat. She's out in November and she's got no coat on. So she's not looking after herself or putting herself first the way she used to when the child was young and she used to give everything to them to look after them. We begin a new stanza and we've moved time again. We are back in what seems to be the present. It reads, on reaching the top of the hill, I trace the inscriptions of the war memorial. Now the speaker seems to be sad about everyone that has died at war and the large amount of people that this has impacted. Then it says, leaned against it like a wishbone. They sound lifeless and wishing like they could change things. Then the dove pulled freely against the sky, an ornamental stitch. Makes it sound like a mother and child relationship that has been lost by using that symbol of the dove. Then I listened hoping to hear your playground voice catching on the wind. Makes it sound like all the speaker wants is for it to go back to a time where the child is still a child and possibly to change the way things turned out. So we seem to find out that this mother is so angry because they lost their child and we can assume it's a male from the way that their hair is constructed so the mother lost her son and it was something to do with war and now it's nearly remembrance day so she's remembering when her child was little and the day that he left and possibly regretting that she let him go Now that we understand the narrative of the poem, we need to be able to evaluate how the poet conveys meaning to the reader. So how is the poet getting their message across? How are the words packed full of links that trigger feelings within us, the reader? There are two main steps to this. Step one, figure out the poet's overall message. Bear in mind, there's probably more than one. Step two, explain how they're getting this message across to the reader. These messages will be big concepts and they won't come across in just one line of the poem. So you're looking for big ideas that are apparent in multiple lines of the poem. We will now look at three of the main messages that I hear when I read poppies and how Jane Weir conveys this meaning to the reader. The first message the writer successfully conveys is that dealing with grief and loss can change a person's reality or the way they perceive reality. This loss of reality is first depicted through the speaker's loss of their sense of time. There are several references to time throughout the text, which make the story's narrative timeline difficult to define. We move from three days before Armist Sunday to before you left, which seems to blur events together, giving the effect that the speaker's lost track of time or no longer cares for time. Then time seems to move too quickly in the split second and you're away. Then move into after you'd gone. And then a vague time frame of later defines the infinite time which follows the loss. So time is a construct that usually matters to us when we have plans. The speaker may feel that she has nothing left to do now without her son. So there's no point tracking it. It's just one big painful experience and she does not foresee a time where she's going to feel better. So this blurred sense of time is then heightened with what seems to be a loss of common sense. Due to it being Armist Sunday, the audience can assume it's November, yet the speaker is outside without a winter coat or reinforcements of scarf and gloves. This vividly shows how challenging day to day life has become because of how much space the grief is taking up. As the reader sees a woman who was focused enough to clean her son's uniform, change and become someone who forgets her own coat. The speaker then spends the majority of the poem in past tense, reliving memories. I wanted to graze my nose across the tip of your nose 
play at being Eskimos like we did when you were little indicates that she cherishes the time spent showing love and affection to her child and then it moves on to I listened hoping to hear your playground voice catching on the wind it implies she wishes she could go back in time this shows that the speaker is continuously longing for the time that has passed and perhaps it shows the reader that she regrets willingly allowing her son to leave this is further supported by the ambiguous language used throughout the poem although it's strongly implied it never actually says that the son has died so it's unclear if she's mourning him leaving or mourning his death or perhaps both maybe she doesn't want to say or talk about it directly because it's too painful on the contrary he left in a yellow blazer which doesn't sound like an army uniform so how, perhaps he went off to boarding school and she's comparing it to going off to the army because it's so close to army sunday finally this blurred reality is maintained through the mixed metaphors the speaker struggles to clarify what happened to her son instead using mixed bird metaphors which could be euphemisms for his death but she may use a variety because of her inability to process her loss and grief the speaker begins by saying to her son directly you were away and after you'd gone i went into your bedroom which isn't particularly clear if he left to go somewhere else <clears throat> or if he died then the use of release a songbird from its cage later a single dove flew from the pear tree and the dove pulled freely against the sky they seem to be images of death when com combined with graveyard imagery and war memorials but her unwillingness to say the words imply to the reader that she's unwilling to deal with the grief and wants to stay in this land of memories instead of reality to feel close to him even though it's really painful for her The second message the author powerfully portrays is that war impacts everyone around a soldier, not just the soldier themselves. So in a rare but effective choice, this narrative perspective is from the mother of a soldier. Usually we hear from soldiers themselves. However, the I was brave shows that whole families struggle with people joining the army, not just the soldiers themselves. The use of the personal pronoun shows that the speaker found this situation difficult, even though she was only witness to it and did not herself join the army or leave. The past tense of the word was could imply that she no longer feels brave because he is gone and she misses him a great deal. And the increased use of Cesora following this sentence could imply that she's holding back her emotions as if becoming upset perhaps the speaker wishes she hadn't been brave then her son may not have thought it was okay to leave and stating this information makes her feel guilty as if she's now choked up on emotion and can no longer see the value of being brave and is stuttering because she's getting upset this effectively demonstrates the journey a mother goes on to do what's best for her child balancing between what is the child wants and what the mother wants and what people believe is best for them this is further reiterated in the way that the speaker's everyday language is littered with war jargon. The references to blockades, reinforcements and rounded showcase how much it's affected her life and how it's always on her mind because it's now embedded in the language the speaker uses in her everyday life. The negativity of how she views the army and war is made apparent within the violent vocabulary choices. It's subtle but within words like spasms, flattened, through, the underlying destructive connotations of the words within this semantic field could imply that the speaker feels her life has been destroyed because of the war, as this may be where her son died and his death has left her empty and mourning, like so many other families who lose people to war. Then there's another dimension added to this loss and grief because even before his death she struggled with him leaving after you'd gone i went into your bedroom released the songbird from its cage 
This was straight after he'd left the house. So we can assume that nothing bad had happened yet, other than him leaving and moving out of the family home. This shows how painful children growing up and leaving their parents can be, and how she wishes she could continue to mother him forever, shown through her want to, to look after him in smooth down your shirt, upturned collar, and I resisted the impulse to touch his hair. This shows the reader that the speaker is trying to suppress her maternal instincts in an attempt to give her child the independence he craves, but that this is a really difficult thing to do, ultimately showing she's willing to sacrifice herself and her own emotions for her son's happiness, thus putting her child before herself and hurting herself in the process. The third message the author vividly depicts is that parents struggle with their children growing up and leaving home, even when they remain alive. This is first highlighted through the nostalgia presented in When You Were Little and how it has a general reflection on the happiness within all of the childhood experiences. This is then supported in the idea that the speaker believes the child left too early and very quickly. And they have lost power to watch over them and help them as the verb split in a split second and you were away has connotations of speed and pain. To split something is aggressive and implies it's been left broken. And finally, the parent's inner conflict is showcased through the hiding of their own pain, seen in steal the softening of my face. To steal means to harden, and in this case it means to harden themselves against the emotions being caused in this situation, as the parent doesn't want the child to know that they don't want this to happen, in case this guilts them into not living their life the way they want to. This self-sacrifice shows the purity and selflessness of the love that is often linked to parenting. Within this poem, we see evidence of multiple conflicts, such as human versus human between the mother and son, human versus society in the large losses that war brings, and human versus self in the grief the mother feels. However, I believe the central conflict is human versus society, as we rarely see the reality of the friends and family of soldiers. How society and those in power forget that these people are just as affected by the circumstances, but receive little to no help. The themes that stem from this are guilt, loss and parenthood. I believe the central idea about power is that when parents give up their power to protect their children every day, it is a huge loss that is grieved for in a similar way to death.